guys come back and where it all started and, and let you all know what I've been up to over on the other side of this massive and tortured continent at the moment. So I, as Rich said, I'm a postdoc here at UQ with the Threatened Species Recovery Hub and for a, a few reasons I ended up moving myself to WA to work on uh, the Western Ringtail Possum, which I'll talk a little bit about. And it's been, it's been pretty insightful, um, a big learning curve, and yes, definitely running, running the show, so to speak, pretty solo, and, and hopefully not making a complete schmuggle of it. <laughs> so I'm very fortunate to have my position here at UQ, and I'm, I'm, it's nice to be back home, so to speak, talking to you today. I also do have a visiting uh, researcher position with UWA, so Richard Hobbs has been very kind in hosting me there. And uh, yeah, it's been a wild ride. So a few quick things that I thought I'd just quickly get out from the outset because it's pretty, it's pretty dismal out there at the moment and I'm, I'm hoping to perk you up a bit and motivate and invigorate you a little bit. So a few quick things. Don't ever, ever underestimate the impact that you can have as an individual. We have such a, a tendency to feel like we're completely helpless in this game and I think what we can do in a conversation with with strangers with friends and family we must never underestimate that so if you feel like you're, you're really fighting a losing battle just just go and have a chat with someone because conversations are super important our ability to sit down and talk to people about what we are passionate about why we're doing what we're doing, it's, it, you cannot put a measure on it, to be honest, how that can actually rub off on other people. And that's really what keeps me going. Listening is also really, really important. And I learnt this working in sales for a long time. I, uh, I was never the type of salesperson that would just assume to know what my customer wanted and go and get that product for them and go, this is what you need. I was always the kind of person that would ask the questions, lots and lots of questions, and I would never bring up the product until they did. So, for our game, asking them about what they do in their free time. Without getting, giving yourself away too much, how do you engage with nature? Let them tell you how they do it, and then let them ask you what you do, and go from there. And listening to their story, and tailoring your story and what you tell them is, is really, really important. Because the reality is, we really do need people on our side. We are going to get nowhere if we do not inspire and motivate the people we share this planet with to be on board with us. And I think we look at the media at the moment and that's definitely the story we're seeing. We, we definitely we need an army. We are and in a battle. So, doesn't come naturally to everybody, but I would try to search within yourself, find your inner salesperson. I am still selling. I'm still selling features and benefits and what this can do for you. And this is no different. Conservation of nature is no different. So find that inner used car salesman and, and channel it in your interactions with people. So just a quick recap on what I've been doing with the Threatened Species Recovery Hub. So I started here at UQ, beginning of 2017. I set about doing a review of the existing citizen science landscape for threatened species in this country. And so I learned about some of the amazing things being done for whale shark, um, with ecotourists out on the reef photographing these amazing creatures. Of course, we all know their markings are like their fingerprint and then uploading those images to a global database for whale sharks. I was also in a pretty full-on project planning phase in that year and thinking about how we were going to take what we learned in that review and potentially hit the ground and, and try some ideas for citizen science with a particular threatened species in mind. So come 2018, we, we worked out that the government were pretty keen to see something uh, based on the Western Ringtail Possum, which is critically endangered on both the WA and EPBC legislation. 
So I decided that it would probably work best with such a multidisciplinary project if I put myself square in Western Ringtail territory. And so I moved myself to WA and began some pretty fierce stakeholder engagement, locking people in a room with me and pumping them for all of their ideas and, and thoughts and, and gripes as well, for that matter. Data collection and write-up starting to get underway and then last year in 2019, wrapping up that data collection, <coughs> engaging with the broad community, rolling out some neat media uh, around the species and now I find myself really at the pointy end, finishing up in March and hoping to get all of my outputs done and dusted. <coughs> so it's been a pretty full on few years can't believe how many people I've spoken to. So a little bit about this very critter I've been working on, the Western Ringtail Possum. It is a completely separate species to the Eastern counterpart and has been uh, recognised as such for some time. It is a Southwest endemic. It is found from Mandra, just south of Perth, round that Southwest corner to Albany, pretty much along that sort of inner, inner coastal strip. And then we have a bit of a population uh, centre in the southern forest around a, a crazy town called Manjimup, where they have awesome truffles and wine. And so it's restricted to that area. And within that area, it appears to have certain habitat preferences in different parts of its range. But generally speaking, it's pretty strongly associated with metaceae-based vegetation communities, so your eucalypts and your peppermint trees. Um, and it also does turn up in a few urban areas, which is a whole other story and has been a source of much amusement for me. So like the eastern ringtail, it has three to eight drays per home range. And if you're not familiar with the ringtail, the dray is, it's a nest. It uh, has a few of them throughout the area because it likes to have multiple real estate. You know, it has a summer home and a winter home. And that's where it sleeps during the day when it's not out terrorising backyards at night time. And it breeds in winter, so that's similar to the eastern species, and it is a strict herbivore, so flowers and leaves are its main food source. It's critically endangered, and it's kind of, it's caught in a bit of a, a rock and a hard place, this species, because of where it occurs in different parts of its range, there are different threats. And that actually makes broad-scale conservation messaging for the species quite challenging. Overarchingly, Habitat loss, fragmentation and degradation, as with everything else. Uh, so lots of clearing in what we call the coastal, the Swan Coastal Plain for urbanisation is probably one of the bigger threats to the species recently and in the short term. Inhospitable novel habitats. That's urban areas, roads, streets, cars, cats and dogs in backyards and some not very willing human hosts either. The other issue that the species does is challenged by is misunderstandings about its ID among certain parts of the community. There are heaps of people that know exactly the difference between a ringtail and a brushtail, but there are quite a few that don't, not least of which my fellow countrymen Kiwis, who come to Australia and see the ringtail and think it's the same as the brushtail that's defoliating the forest in New Zealand. So, there are multiple instances where the species does get con confused with other animals. Human wildlife conflict, they're not opposed to getting into your roof, they're not opposed to nibbling on your garden plants. So that does tend to create some uh, disgruntled residents where they have ringtails in their gardens. And of course, the elephant in room for just about everything, climate change. So the main cause, we the concern we have around climate change for the Western ringtail is that the remnant habitat that we have left is drying and so increasingly it's looking like moisture content in the forest uh, is, is a real limiting factor for the species being able to persist in those remnant forest patches. So that's what the ringies are up against. What I was up against as a researcher heading over to WA it is a really highly contested stakeholder environment. There are a lot of people that care for this animal, that have been working on this animal for a long time, both in the research space, the carer slash rehabilitation space, and the government and non-government space. So there, it's got a lot of hearts and minds looking out for it. And turning up 
as, a, as an Eastern researcher and being an outsider in that territory, that was definitely a challenge to begin with. So I had to work very hard to build trust and build rapport with a lot of people for them to let me in and, uh, and help me to help them, basically. So it, was, it wasn't easy, but at the same time, when you do get there and you can see people are willingly wanting to work with you, it's a pretty fantastic feeling. As I touched on just now, the public perceptions about the species, it does have some of those issues around ID. The other thing that I find quite unique in the Southwest is the number of species that are listed and nobody believes they're threatened because they see them every day. So the western ringtail is absolutely a number of people I've spoken to. What do you mean they're endangered? I see it every day in my garden. So how can it be threatened when I have four of them in my garden eating my plants? So trying to communicate to them how and why the species finds itself listed as critically endangered hasn't been without its challenges. Black cockatoos are another one got my own gripe with them, feeding on massive gum nuts and me spraying my ankle on their litter. <laughs> <sighs> so yes, Southwest has some interesting things with, with threatened species that don't appear to be threatened. And then finding some novel mechanisms to actually get to the community and tell them these stories and explain to them why we have threatened species despite the fact they're seeing them every day, what they can do, overcoming some of this apathy that is chronic in the human community uh, when it comes to biodiversity. So these are certainly things that I had to rack my brain about and, and try and be innovative, uh, not always with the network or the means to get you know, the best outcome. So broadly speaking, I had some project aims. So we wanted to have a project that resulted in some improved management for the Western Ringtail Possum in urban areas in particular. Greater public awareness and engagement for the species and its conservation status. Identify what shared goals and strategies there are among the Western Ringtail Possum conservation efforts because everybody is off doing their own thing and working in their own space. And, and to a lot of people it did seem like everybody wasn't working together towards a common goal and that they were getting bogged down in differences and things like that. And my experience hasn't necessarily found that. I actually think a lot of people are doing the right thing for the place that they're in. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Improved strategies for engaging the public um, in, in, in citizen science work, but for threatened species, but also more generally. And of course, direct engagement of the findings that we have to the Western Ringtail Possum Recovery Team, which are the overarching body to, to try and mitigate the species from going extinct. So when I got there, I had to identify my players in the game, and this is just a handful of the different organisations that I've had to uh, schmooze with and spend time with to get to know what they're doing, what they would like to be doing and what their challenges are. So, and it ranges from state government, local government and a lot of our um, non-government NGO uh, catchment council groups rather. I then had to find a way to connect with these people and, and basically it says we use the term engagement and, and we use it a lot Basically, you just need to find a way to make them like you and trust you. And, and once you get over that, once you build that rapport, you're away. And sure, not everybody is going to like you. That's wishful thinking to, to think that you could do it with everybody. But that shouldn't stop you from trying to still put your best foot forward, so to speak. So I had to do a lot of making the first contact and when you work in sales, that's the girl in the shop coming up to you going, Hello, how are you today? Anything I can help you with? <laughs> uh, and they go, I'm just looking. So, <laughs> and, it's, and it's exactly the same emotion. When you are that sales girl, you are consumed by a fear of rejection. And when you're in the stakeholder engagement and relationship brokering and all those lingo terms, when you're trying to get these people to just give you a go, that fear of rejection is massive. And you're not even asking for much. You're asking for their time. First off, that's all you're asking for. Just a bit of time. So 
pick up the phone, call, send an email. If you send the email and you don't get a response, pick up the phone. Nothing beats a phone call. And, uh, and ask for their time. Tee up a meeting. If they can't do it in person, make a phone call meeting, anything. Then you work around their schedule. So I, I had to put my humble hat on big time. You know, it was them doing me this massive favour by giving me their time. And, and that means that because then my schedule obviously is, is busy, I don't necessarily tell them that, but I get in early. So I give them plenty of time. I'm also giving me plenty of time. And then really actively show gratitude for them actually sitting down with you and, and having that conversation. Because if you make a song and dance, oh, I'm so, so thankful that you could find your time, your busy schedule, I know you're under the pump. You know, really give them that affirmation that you recognise they are just as time poor and up against it as we are. They're working in the same space, just in a different system. So being, being gracious is, is very important. And of course, listening actively and carefully, listening for those subtle, people will not always use their words, they'll use other sorts of cues like their tone and their body language and look for the eye roll when you ask them about some department or person or, and just file that stuff away. Don't necessarily, you know, react to it, file it away. It's all part of the picture you're building. It's really important to cement the bond that you create on those first meetings. And the best thing you can do first off is just to send a quick follow-up email. Thanks so much. It was great to catch up. Maybe we could get together at such and such event or, or just anything to, to keep that chain going. So that then when you, when you make contact again, they're not like, oh, you only sat down with me once. I never heard from you again. Cementing the bond is, is a way to make it that ice is already broken for the next time you make contact. The thing that, that I sort of wasn't necessarily expecting, but I definitely came up against um, was there's a quite a lot of apathy among government and non-government towards research and, and academic conservation because we are on short-term cycles. <clears throat> so I actually had some feedback uh, where it said, you know, these academics that blow in and they just do their thing and they disappear. She's not going to be around for the long term. I would love to be around for the long term. It's out of my control. So there is being mindful that there is a bit of a bit of distrust, hesitation to give you their time and anything else when they're expecting that you're going to up and leave in the not-too-distant future. So just have that forefront of mind. They're fatigued as much as we are by the system we work in. So what I would tend to do then to try and get around that is, just as I did in sales, under-promise, over-deliver. So if they're telling you, we need this, we need that, we need this, be like, okay, all right, well, what I think I can really feasibly achieve working with you on this is this and this. I don't think I'm going to be able to do this for you or with you. I'm really sorry. Definitely do not tell them you're going to do everything that they need and then bail because that just cements everything they, they feel up here. So an example is I've worked pretty closely with, with this lady here. She works for a catchment council called Southwest Catchment Council. They oversee distribution of NLP funding, National Land Care Program funding, to subsidiary catchment groups. And she basically was the person that inherited my project when her predecessor scored me some funding through NLP to get one of my project outputs produced. When, but then this lady had to come in and actually do it with me. So she was a little bit overwhelmed. Um, we were working together to make sure that what we were producing was great. And then what I also did was I made a point of showing up to some of their community tree planting events. So it was an extra thing that she could then wheel out to all the people that would come like, oh, we've got Dr. Rochelle Stephen here, blah, blah, blah. I'm just there to get some trees in the ground and 
chat about possums to people if they felt like it, but it meant quite a lot to her to have that extra value add there for her community event. It didn't really cost me too much at all to be there that day, but it meant a huge amount to her. So look for those opportunities to, to give that little bit extra. And then the other thing that I quite often make sure I do is that I show them how their input has then informed and shaped my own plans. So straight away, during the process, they're seeing how I have integrated their needs, wants, desires into my plans. And that's really powerful for them as well. So then I went and I got underway with actually planning my work. So there's a huge preamble to all of my actual on-ground work. It was massive. And uh, so I had to... Apologies. Collate all of the information that I have been given in these, these chats with people and look at where the common threads were across all of the different uh, groups and individuals. Identify those things that I thought I could do. What's feasible? What could I integrate into what we need to deliver to the department? And so finding those opportunities to modify my existing plans with that information and being able to be adaptive was, was really important. The other thing that I found very useful was finding other frameworks to just, as a bit of a checking mechanism, go and align what I planned with something else that someone else has already created. So that's a really convoluted way of saying, I got the recovery plan and I looked at the section in the recovery plan that kind of spoke to where I was working and I went, okay, for that I'm doing that and that I'm doing that. And that was so useful to the department uh, and to a lot of the, the members of the recovery team. They loved it. So if you have to do any of this for the species you're working on, I would strongly suggest getting your project and the recovery plan and seeing where they mesh. So... I set about a UWA Albany collaboration after the stakeholder workshops. That was a big win from one of my consultation stints. I also then went and interviewed the conservation practitioners and land managers across the whole species range. So 30 interviews I have done with people working at the coalface for this species across its whole range. And I don't know many other threatened species that that has been done for. If any of you do, please tell me. We, we struck up a really neat collaboration with the Call Hub, which I'll talk about. You've probably seen the, um, the Possum and Glider app module that we released as part of their Urban Wildlife Program. And I ran quite a number of community <laughs> engagement habitat enhancement workshops throughout Southwest, specifically uh, flagshipped by the Western Ringtail Possum. So as I was saying, I did get in quite early and presented to the recovery team what I was planning on doing with their prize species. You know, your playground, I'm playing with your toy. What am I going to do with your toy? So this, I, I got together. Now these are people that have been working in this space for a long time. I was completely at their mercy as a firing squad, so to speak. And there were people in there that were super keen and then there were us that had real grave concerns. And so finding a way to illustrate to all of them in a clear way what I plan on doing and how it was going to benefit them was really important. So, I basically got a hold of the recovery plan and those objectives and I'm going to show you what I've showed them. So I copied and pasted this straight out of, there we go, oh it's not working on that screen, out of the recovery plan document. So it's objective five in that particular recovery plan and then within that objective there's all of these sub actions or sub objectives that they, this is their text, this is not mine. I got my research activities that I was planning on doing and I it's a messy slide but it's got a lot of really cool information. So targeted publicity campaign for the Western Ringtail Possum across its range came that was something the Commonwealth wanted and it spoke to recovery plan actions 5.1 and 5.3. Reviewing the existing and public participation activity the existing public participation activities in citizen science, 
That was something DBCA, so the state government, wanted, and it spoke to RP Action 5.2, and so on. So that I had, this is who has told me they want this, and this is how it fits into the recovery plan. Very, very useful to, as a checking mechanism for you to guys, what I'm doing even really wanted, needed, or useful. Um, and to illustrate to them that you have engaged with this document in a really meaningful way. Uh, so this is this can be this model can be used for so many species. So this is some of the fun stuff. I got to go out and I, I did some numbers before. So I've spoken to something like 380 people in community workshops, and this is a couple of them. So. I did a bunch of these in the lead up and post the launch of the app that we launched. So we, we did the possum glider module uh, as a part of the call urban wildlife app. So it was already flying foxes, insects and frogs. And then we added the possums and gliders because it made sense to just slot it in there then to come up with a whole other tool. The department loved it because it was cross hub collaboration. And it just made sense because these species do, heaps of them do occur in the urban matrix. Let's definitely target that uh, sales pitch as an angle to get more data points on the map. Now we also, so we did the, the, a lot of these workshops beforehand to get the momentum happening, get people excited about the app that they need to look out for it. And then thereafter so that I could go around and basically train everybody in how we wanted them to use it, particularly in ringtail territory. The thing is, is that the app actually covers all 30 odd species of possum glider in Australia. Why, why do it just for one? The ringtail just became a flagship icon for every possum glider in Australia. So we, we didn't really make that much difference to the bottom line of getting it developed and there's a lot of species that would benefit from exercise <coughs> on the ground. Often, yes, definitely in these settings you're preaching to the converted. But there are those instances where you have fresh blood that turns up in front of you and oh, you just love those moments. So I had two ladies come to one of my workshops in Tasmania. The Western Ringtail is not there. That's a whole other story. Come and talk to me about it. <laughs> but um, I, ha I had two people turn up to one of my workshops. This is despite three radio interviews Yana doing sponsored posts on Facebook promoting it. The, net, the national the natural resource management group sending it out to their network. It was so Launceston is a tough community to do this kind of work in. Just so you know. So I had these two ladies turn up and they stood there and they were like, "Oh, will you still do it if there's only two of us?" I said, "Have you ever been?" Because they, were, sorry, they were just like me, mid thirties just looked exactly kind of like me, okay? I said, have you been to anything like this before? And they said, no, never. I said, you're not going anywhere. You have your age group, that you have a network, you can go and be my agents of change in the community here, and it's going to be intimate, there's going to be heaps of time for back and forth. I swear, I feel like I made more impact with those two women in that room that night than I did in a lot of the workshops with a dozen going, you know, you know that they're not, you're not teaching them anything. Whereas these, these women are sitting there, what? Sugar gliders were introduced to Tasmania? What? They eat swift parrots? Oh my goodness, we have to do something, you know? And, and it's such a great feeling to know that you have reached new people that have network and are going to go out and talk about this stuff at their barbecue. It's super powerful. So definitely opportunity to inspire those critical conversations that I spoke about. My workshops are always pretty positive and upbeat, a bit like this. So the language you use, I didn't bog them down with a lot of the scientific ecological lingo. Um, and connect with them. Oh, those possums, they get in your roof. I understand sleep deprivation. It is not cool. Let's find a solution. Uh, definitely show empathy towards any conflicts they have and, and work together. So at the workshops in the southwest, we also use that as a means to give habitat plants for the western ringtail possum. Basically, 
catalyzing these these attendees to these workshops to, well, yes, learning the app, going to go home and use the app, take plants, put them in my garden for the possum, yes. So, and I have all of their names and, and email addresses to, to be able to check how those plants are going and get an idea of just how much habit, extra habitat have we infilled into these urban environments. And this was a very happy recipient of that whole tray of 40 plants. And he sent me photos of them in the ground, bless him. So really feel good stuff. And by golly, we need it. We really need these positive experiences for them and for us, if for no other reason than our self-preservation. This kind of stuff keeps you going. When you have someone standing there looking that happy about putting a tray of plants in their own land, ah, oh, that's what makes me want to get up the next day and keep doing it. We need it, otherwise we just go, why are we here? What are we doing? So this is some more pictures. It ranged from yeah, eight to 10 people to 100 odd, and super exciting, super fun to be talking about a neat tool that they can use to tell us about the biodiversity they have in their backyard. They don't even need to get in their car and drive anywhere. Now, I thought I'd put some of the quotes, I won't read them all to you, but these are things that people told us in the feedback forms, how will you apply the things you've learned from this event. Some of the key things that I love, first of all, they've written this. It is a written affirmation. That, that is very powerful. To spread the awareness. They're going to tell people. All right. They're, they're having actions. They're planting the plants that they've been given. They're going to use the app on their phone and I'm going to talk to my science teacher at the city and, and the city of Bunbury and tell them about it as well like they're, t they're writing all these things they're going to do after learning just that little bit of information very 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 uh, heartening but fantastic to see what effect you can have having a conversation with someone so providing a safe habitat pets being kept inside at night uh, I'll report back with the app, I'll make sure my garden is possum friendly, and I'll be more careful when driving through known possum areas. All of these amazing, I don't even talk about driving in my workshops. They're thinking that on their own. So this one is also super cool. Include the data in my teaching program at U3A. Who doesn't know what U3A is? Hmm. University of the Third Age. So it's, <laughs> my dad. Um, so the University of the Third Age, it's, it's volunteer-led education to retirees, basically. So a lot of the time it's using digital software like tablets and cameras and things like that. But it could just be about anything, dancing, painting. I ran one on birds, Australian birds down on the Gold Coast and bless this person, they're going to talk to some of the hardest to convert demographic about possum conservation. So that's awesome. The other thing that I really tried to do, which was, which was great for impact for this work, was to be adaptive and grab some novel opportunities as they arise. I had 2,000 plants that I needed to get in the ground. And some of the workshops weren't filling up the people as much as the plants were needing to get into the ground. So, um, okay, need land, need people that like possums, need to get lots of plants in the ground quickly. Wineries, because I knew a couple of wineries near Margaret River, ringtail habitat, that were pro-conservation. So this one is called Passel Estate. Very nice wine, best Chardonnay in Margaret River in my opinion. And they have actually designated their whole riparian area as land for wildlife and conservation sanctuary. So I was lucky enough to collaborate and engage with TAFE Southwest. All the horticulture students propagated these amazing plants. I had 300 odd plants from them. I went out to Parcel and I'd already been there for a glass of wine one afternoon and made contact with the cellar door manager. This is all very important preamble stuff to research. But what it meant was I could get on the phone to Sandy and go, hey, you need plants? I've got plants. Can you get your gardener in for the day? I will come down and we'll get these plants in the ground. And she even rustled up some community members as well. So that was fantastic. Likewise, Will's Domain. So this is Susie Strapp. She's the president of Fauna, one of the rehabilitation groups in the region. 
also happens to be married to the owner of Will's Domain and they have two massive patches of habitat on their land connected with a completely void section of creek. And so, again, got on the phone to Susie. Let's get some plants into Will's Domain land. And so I went out, met with her husband. He said, okay, let's do this. We'll plant, plant out in this section here and we'll start to link these two patches of bush together so the species can traverse over a large area. Fantastic stuff. Great story for them, great story for the hub, great outcome for the possum. And I do not advocate holding wild animals, but this was the one and only time I actually got my hands on a western ringtail possum because Susie happened to have one in care with her that day. And they are super, super adorable. I was also a bit of a media tart, so, because I needed to get the message out to as wide an <coughs> audience as possible, I decided that I would make contact with the person that was a regular writer for the Bustleton Dunsborough Times. Uh, she writes their wildlife focus column and I got in touch with her and I said, how would you feel about me hijacking your column for a few months? And she said, sure. So I ran three stories about possums. The first story was Western Ringtail Possums, Precious or Pesky? Because there are a lot of haters in that community. So I needed to pitch the both sides from the outset. And so I then go into a bit of a talk about, yeah, they do this and it's annoying, but they're kind of in trouble. And that's where I went from there. With, a, with one as well, promoting the app when it was launched to get people on board and also jumping on radio whenever I can and talk about the um, events that were happening throughout the region. Now, I'm an academic at the moment, so I also actually needed to do some research that would have some useful outcomes along the way. So with that UWA collaboration that I mentioned, we did some experiments around the citizens' ability to identify between western ringtail possums and brush-tail possums, uh, getting an idea of how well people can differentiate between these two species, particularly on their own land. We have already got new records for the species with the data from the app. So there are, there are places in the southwest of Australia that haven't had the species re recorded since 1998 that we have got confirmed sighting, sadly confirmed with a dead one, but nonetheless confirmed that the western ringtail is still in living in certain areas that it hasn't been recorded in for over 20 years. Challenges facing conservation practitioners across the whole species range, so I'm currently looking at all of that information from those interviews that I did. Very rich data. Unbelievable, the things that when you build rapport and trust, the things that people feel safe telling you and you're recording it, awesome. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens with the analysis with that. And there is more, but that's all the academic stuff. And I wanted you to walk out of here feeling really powered and, and upbeat despite it all. So go to the cafe, tell the person making your coffee what's your favourite animal and why. Because I tell people about the mating life of wasps and orchids all the time. Thank you very much. to download. Uh, as I said, it's, so it's called CAUL, Clean Air Urban Landscapes Hub. So we're all through the National Environmental Science Hub. There's six hubs, Threatened Species Recovery Hub, a Clean Air Urban Landscapes Hub. There's quite a bit of crossover. So Pia Lentini um, is down in Melbourne. She does stuff on the flying foxes. So she's got a module in there, um, which because she's threatened species, it's another example. And basically what it does, actually you can come to the Fuller Lab meeting on Thursday if you really want to get a good insight because I'll be going through basically the, the community workshop I did where I explained how people use it. But it's a, it's a form, basic one form, scroll through. Uh, it uses the GPS in the smart device to grab the Latin long and then they tell me whether how many they're seeing, which species it is. Uh, the species is geo a geofenced, so that means that it uses the GPS on their device to block out any species that it is unlikely to be. So 
so they cannot record eastern ringtails on the west coast and vice versa. Uh, they can do photographs and video, which can be really useful because I actually ask them if they're feeding on a plant, what plant, and if people don't know, I've made a big point of saying take a photo and that will help us to ID the plant, their post hoc kind of stuff. So uh, then there's also, yeah, the number, if they, if what are they doing? Are they just creeping, watching, and they're just sitting still watching me? Yeah, that's fine, sitting, no activity. But there's also mating, sleeping, running along a fence line, running along a roof line, uh, in a tree, all those kinds of behavioural stuff. Uh, and and also notes. So I ask them if they can tell me what plant. That's great. Uh, any other notes? And then the kicker is that. We also ask them how they feel if they're observing it on their own land. Are they happy, indifferent, or unhappy? And um, yeah, to try and get people, give people that don't like the species an opportunity to vent. It's very powerful to get them not to have it. It's more keeping me awake. That can be enough for some people just to tell somebody. But also, um, when I go in and I look at that data and I go, okay, everyone on Beach Road, they're really not happy about possums in their garden. City of Bunbury, it might be an idea to go out there, do some education, but also start offering some nest boxes and all that kind of thing. So it can guide some of the on-ground people where there might be opportunities to engage better. Uh, and that's about it. So I have a follow-up question. Yeah. Um, so you're saying it's all fossils and gliders. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, like, our brain gliders are declining and, you yeah. know, probably... That's really right. ...badly affected by fossil and stuff. Yeah. Um, I hadn't heard about your app, but yeah. I just think like, it could be promoted on the East Coast. You're not following the Hub's Facebook page, are you? I probably am. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, yeah. So that's, and that's really what was awesome when I went to ESA to be able to go, awesome, while I'm there, rolling out a bunch of community workshops promoting the app there. That's the beauty of including all species. So if somebody would like to sponsor me to go to Southwest. Australia, Southeast Australia and talk about the different species of possum and glider and why we might want to be monitoring them down there. This is going to be a really neat legacy thing for me. I can wheel this out regionally relevant forever if I want. So yeah, it can be the way we communicate about this app and, and mobilise people to use it can absolutely be regionalised for different conservation challenges just as I did for sugar gliders in Tasmania. Any other questions or comments? No? Cool. Thank okay, you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Michelle. And, um, <laughs> I think it was really wonderful to hear, I think, sort of first person what it was like to, to be engaged in such a project. And I think that's often we don't spend enough time talking about that aspect of our work. I think, and I'm especially guilty of that. We focus on all the academic stuff. Yeah. And we forget about some of the core skills as human beings that, that we need to be engaging in this kind of project. Thank you.